you know, what I admire about Unitarians is that they have a, a deep, genuine um, love uh, for the Hebrew Bible. And I say Unitarians were lowercase u. I include, you know, Chris Delphians and so mm -hmm. on. The, you know, the, the reason why, the, the fundamental reason why they reject the doctrine of the Trinity is because it's not compatible with the Hebrew Bible. It's not only not compatible with it, but the Hebrew Bible opposes this idea. Yes. There is one God and there is no other. You know, there's just no, he alone is God. You know, Isaiah 46 verse 9. And that's, you know, that's something that, you know, as a Jew, I really admire about Unitarians is, so it's obviously they don't believe in Trinity. That's because the Trinity is the most offensive Christian doctrine. I, I'm using the word Christian not to offend you, but it's the most, sure. you know, 98 oh, yeah. percent of, but, um, but I would just say this to my Unitarian friends out there, and that is that if you really are going to turn to the uh, Hebrew Bible, then please do do you know? Do you know? Do look up what the Messiah is supposed to do. You know, is he? You know, looking at Isaiah eleven, he's supposed to judge people, not after the sight of his eyes. But there's nothing about him dying for anyone's sins, or anyone can die for anybody's sins. And you know, there's not supposed to be war. There's supposed to be universal knowledge of God and in gathering the exiles. And I just encourage people to just begin with the Hebrew Bible. We were talking about a gospel problem. I would just say, let's go back to the Hebrew Bible, the original text, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 2, Ezekiel 37. These are the very famous Messianic chapters. Mm -hmm. And look at what the Messiah is supposed to do. It's all those things that I... And then ask yourself, are the teachings of the New Testament compatible with them or not? You know, it's, so that's a very... Was, you know, I appreciate very much that challenge. I really do. <laughs> oh. So that's something that I have asked myself. And it, as far as my faith perspective goes, I really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, and that's what makes him the Messiah. And, and as the resurrected one, he is coming back to earth to establish that reign and rule, that peace, and the, the things that are found in the Old Testament, in those most famous passages of the Old Testament. So where, where, where in the Hebrew Bible does it ever say that the Messiah is supposed to rise from the dead? I don't believe it says that anywhere. So then how, why is that? It means then how could you believe that the Messiah is supposed to rise from the dead and therefore is Jesus a non sequitur? So, that means that the Hebrew Bible never says the Messiah is supposed to rise from the dead. And you're right. You are not mischaracterizing Paul, Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. The yes. resurrection is core to everything. That's, what you're doing is you're italicizing the problem rather than solving it. The problem is that in Tanakh, there's nothing remotely resembling this. Rather, the Messiah is a Davidic king, an heir to the promise, who through the Spirit of God is able to judge, rebuke, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11. There's nothing about him resurrecting from the dead. Or if you believe in him, that you'll be saved. If you don't believe in him, you'll be damned. There's nothing like that. So the Apostle Paul says in Romans, is it chapter 8? He says, if you confess the Lord Jesus, and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that salvation is a salvation of that exists in God's new creation, which, which Isaiah is describing. And when, it, when we talk about the, the reign of Messiah as being an eternal reign, it seems like the resurrection would be a good way to achieve that, that Messiah actually is meant to live forever. As the apostles, the apostles uh, questioned Jesus when Jesus said he was going to have to die. They asked, well, doesn't the law say that Messiah lives forever? Um, but as we know, men die, <laughs> but when one is raised from the dead to life, immo immo you know, immortal life, and given a new body, a new creation body, it's not a problem to reign eternally and to exercise God's rule upon earth as that son of David, as according to those promises. So there, I think, you know, from the perspective that we can believe the Old Testament, but with the knowledge of this resurrection, we can see actually, even though it may have been very surprising at the time, 
The disciples of Jesus themselves did not know this was going to happen until after the fact, that it makes sense now how this could be accomplished. But what you're doing is you're, 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 high, you're, you're ginning up the problem. You're not solving it. That means the question is, Paul is making claims about a new creation, a new humanity. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware of that. Yes. Paul is also claiming that Jesus rose from the dead according to the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, mm -hmm. or 2 and 3, 4. Then what we do is we have to say, okay, all right, now the question is, this is Paul lived 2,000 years ago, and the question is, do we believe him or not, or do we not believe him? Oh. That means that, now, what we, how do we measure that? How do we know? So what we do is we say, all right, let's go to the Hebrew Bible. So I, I, you're absolutely correct. You're not mischaracterizing Paul. Paul is saying those things. But that's, in fact, the problem. These ideas are not found in the Hebrew Bible. Moreover, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul claims that Jesus rose from the dead according to the Scripture on the third day. And there is no scripture like that. It doesn't exist. You have the same problem in Luke 24, 44 through 46. So the New Testament is making vacuous um, claims that these are very, these are fantastic claims, but the evidence is it doesn't even exist because there are no such uh, prophecies. All, all you, you can, if you want to, you can infer it. You could do all those things. But the, Paul is saying that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day according to the Scripture. Luke 24, this is the end of the book of Luke, 40 through 4 through 46, it says it's, it's in the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. But when we look at the Hebrew Bible, there's nothing like that. That means that literally Paul is inventing phantom verses that don't exist. So by saying Paul says this, that's the problem. How okay. is Paul I, advancing something that's completely incompatible, that's completely, that doesn't exist in the Hebrew Scriptures? So to, to respond to that, I think, I think of Paul as someone who comes to understand something miraculous, really spectacular, and now he sees into the Old Testament things that, things that are implied, in a sense, implied in light of the resurrection. So the, resur uh, 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 the resurrection of Jesus is so spectacular that it actually sheds light back into the prophecies of the Old Testament. I don't know if does that make sense? It not only makes sense, again, you get an A for, uh, for characterizing Paul's claims. Uh, Paul makes it clear that this is a complete mystery. Paul makes that claim in Ephesians 3, in 1 Corinthians 2. In 1 Corinthians, he says this is a complete mystery, and no one would have even known about it if I didn't have this revelation for you. Paul further says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 and 8, that if the rulers of the generation would have known this mystery that only I have, they would have never crucified Jesus. And that's the point. So in a sense, Paul's right. conceding that no one would have known known any of this. And the reason why is it's, is this, there's nothing like this in the Hebrew Bible. There's no... Now, I just one other caveat. If you're saying that Paul came up, uh, came to give us... Uh, impart a mystery that only he had access to, then what religion then could be dismissed? And then why uh, ignore the doctrine of the Trinity and why reject the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I would oh. posit that the reason you don't believe in more, the Mormon Church is because their teachings are not f to be found anywhere in the Christian Bible, so you believe they're not compatible. That would be your chief reason sure. that— you would also say Joseph Smith was a scoundrel. You would say a lot of other things. But the chief argument against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that the teachings found in this book from the 19th century are just nowhere found right. in, the, in the New Testament. And you would be absolutely correct. And I, as a Jew, would say to you, great, 
apply the same rigorous standard you do for rejecting the ideas that come from the Roman Catholic Church or the Mormon Church. Apply that to the New Testament as well rigorously and demand to have explicit um, evidence because the claim is fantastic. And well, fantastic claim, is fantastic. claim yeah. and fantastic claims require uh, require more than this is going to be offensive than promiscuous claim you know evidence this is not even mediocre evidence there's just nothing about this in the Hebrew Bible. The moment you then appeal that to the idea that Paul had special knowledge. Well, then what religious claim could then be dismissed? Who's well, to say that the church fathers, the saints, didn't have special knowledge? So I would, I guess I would counter with uh, the, uh, the understanding. When Paul is talking about the resurrection of Jesus, he says that there are over 500 brethren that saw him alive. And again, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember, too, that the Ebionites and the Nazarenes that we talked about earlier were Jewish believers in Jesus as the Messiah, and their writings don't exist. <laughs> so, you know, there are things that, are, that, that happened that would have borne witness to this, and unfortunately we don't have the kind of resources to be able to tap into these things, right? Well, we, we don't have... You know, we, there's nowhere where uh, we have that the Ebionites, we don't have anything that the Ebionites wrote. So, you know, we only right. have what the church fathers said the Ebionites, what their enemies said. But we have to always go back to the Hebrew Bible. And if that's not uh, correct, then everything I'm saying is wrong. That means the foundation has to be the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. I mean, Protestants okay. supposedly believe in sola scriptura, right? So only maybe, scripture. Maybe I can... Throw in one more sure. idea. <laughs> so supposing now you are a present day Jew, I guess you would identi identify yourself as a Pharisee. That's what uh, my Tanakh the, talk friends refer, yeah, the, refer to. Yeah, Pharisee you as. is an anachronism for okay, what, yes. what an Orthodox Jew we call okay. it. Sure. So, so back in the day when Jesus walked this earth, the, the Jews were in, as you know, they were. In, in very quite a few different camps. There was a lot of factions of the Jews at the time. Pharisees, Sadducees, Sicarii's, um, and probably probably a whole host of others that I am not that we're not familiar with. And the Romans, the Romans uh, occupied the, the land of Judah, and there was a lot of political jockey mandering going on. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem in the final week, and he's claiming to be the Messiah. Well, that's a pretty dangerous thing to do in that kind of a political environment, isn't it? And we know that he was... Yes, correct? <laughs> well, yeah, but in the, according to the Christian Bible, there are other people running around claiming that they're the Messiah. This is not... You know, this this is not doesn't make you the Messiah. It would get you in trouble for it sure. It would get you in trouble, right? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. It would get you yeah. in trouble. Oh yeah. So, so what we don't know from that story is what would have happened if the Jewish people had accepted Jesus. If the leaders of the Jewish people would have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, we don't know what would have happened. Would God's reign and rule have begun at that point? If Jesus really was the Messiah and he was accepted by the leadership of the Jews at the time and was able to exercise the role as the son of David and sit upon the throne in Jerusalem, what would have happened? <laughs> this we don't oh, yeah. know. So let's, let's be very mm -hmm. clear. I want to make this very clear. Sure. If any person, call me, I mean, you can call him David, you can call him Yehoshua, call him any name you want. If that person would have not only sit on the, sat on the throne of David, but there'd be universal knowledge of God. Well, the knowledge of God covered the world as the water covers the sea, Isaiah 11, verse 9. There was a complete ingathering of the exiles at the time in the first century. The vast majority of Jews did not live in the land of Israel, lived in Babylon, lived in mm -hmm. Africa. If there would have been a building of a temple, but Jesus came all the time, all those things, so it doesn't really work very well. If 
war would have come to an end and the, all the world would have praised God alone, then whoever that was in the first century would have been the Messiah. But it is precisely the opposite that occurred. What happened during the first century is there was no universal peace but wars. Yes. The Jews weren't gathered in. They were expelled. The temple was not built. It was destroyed. There wasn't knowledge of God covered the world, but because of the empire's destruction, knowledge of God was diminished. It means if you want an example of what exactly is not supposed to happen when the Messiah comes, take a look at the first century. So it's the very reverse. You're right. If if whoever was in the first century yes. did everything that says in Isaiah chapter 11, we wouldn't be having this conversation right no, now. No, no. Yeah. So I guess we'll just have to wait to see what comes in the future. Yes? <laughs> or we can – that's a little dangerous because, you know, you're a person who really made an amazing decision in your life to be a Unitarian. Yes. You know, and and an Anabaptist. I'm not going to go into what all those things mean, but yes. you know, Anabaptist was slaughtered by other Christians, not just yes. Catholics, but Protestants. Yes. So that took a lot of courage for you to walk away from the doctrine of the Trinity. And why did you do it? You did it because you said, "I want hard evidence from the Hebrew Bible." Not. Don't tell me we'll see when the Messiah comes if the Trinity is true or not. I need to know now because I want to worship God in truth. And I just say this, and I, you know, I, I say this to all my Christian friends: is to use that rigorous methodology uh -huh. and apply it here, and say, let's look at the Hebrew Bible. What does the Hebrew Bible say? And if there's any accretion that's not consistent with that, then it's a good idea to rethink it. But I, I'm, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Rabbi Tovia, I want to say how much I appreciate you. You're a because sweetheart. we need to be challenged. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I believe you're put there for that purpose. So very much appreciated. Um, but uh, I'm going to stick with the resurrection for now. <laughs> <Okay>. <That's right. laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I have the faith that, that one day we will both know the truth of this matter. So, okay. oh, we, 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 we sure will, because okay. that's part of the so Messianic prophecy. So much appreciate prophecy. the time you've taken. God Thank bless you for you. this wonderful history lesson. Oh, and God's blessing upon you. Amen. Okay. Amen. Farewell. Shalom. Okay.